at this moment, I'd like to invite Brett Viom, who is the president of the CMT Association. He has a couple of remarks for us. And while we're doing that, I'd like Larry Williams to join me over in the AV booth, and we'll get you mic'd up. Brett, thank you very much. The stage is yours, my friend. Brett Viom, the president of the CMT. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the CMT Association 50th Anniversary Seminar. Close down. My name is Brett Viom, um, and I am very lucky and honored to be the president of the CMT Association on its 50th year. Um, I um, have been a member for 23 years, and um, I've been coming to these events ever since my first event in the year 2000, which happened to be the 25th anniversary symposium. And I got to meet all the greats back then, some of which are not here today, unfortunately, but many are. And um, there's a reason that this event is so good, and there's a reason it keeps getting better and better, and guys like me keep coming back year in and year out. And it's, it's not just because the acceptance of technical analysis is growing. Um, that is a factor, and that's a good thing. But it's also because of two men and their dedication and hard work. And that's uh, Bill Kelleher, my fellow board member, and Tyler Wood. So gentlemen, would you come up on stage for a brief moment? So a couple months ago, you know, this conference has been being planned for a whole year. Um, and a couple months ago, I was talking to my fellow board member, Dave Lundgren, and he said, you know, we really ought to do something uh, on behalf of the board for these two guys. So we came up with a plan and uh, I brought these from California, where I live in San Francisco. It's uh, a bottle of Opus One 2019 for each of you. And open it, open it up and see what it says. <laughs> oh my God. It needed to be the CMT Association 50th Anniversary Symposium, April 2023, from the Board of Directors. Thank you so much, Brett. Thanks you to all of you for, uh, for coming here. Thank you so much. Great job, guys. Thank you all. Wow. You know, Wednesday night I was pretty emotional. Actually, Tuesday night I was having a heart attack. And then you all showed up on Wednesday. <laughs> And you made me feel so good that it was actually going to happen. Uh, this has been a tremendous three days, so thank you to each and every single one of you for taking time away from families and work uh, to be here. Three years ago, we elected uh, our winner of the annual award. And this is a recognition for the lifetime achievements of uh, the men and women who have advanced our discipline, who have contributed the most to this community. And then, of course, we got screwed up. We didn't get to have any conference, no awards, no occasion uh, worthy of this gentleman. Um, so I'm gonna invite my friend, Ralph Acampora, who we've heard from uh, the last couple of days, uh, to present the annual award to Tom DeMarc. Ralph Acampora, thank you very much. Wow, three years later. Oh. Well, we got the opportunity, okay? Uh, but I was told that there's a Met in the crowd. Is he here? Oh, yeah, there he is. Tom wanted me to say hello. <laughs> um, where do I start? You know, I used to go to his company, uh, to services, his company with some technical ideas. And, and one day I met this young kid. And he kept saying to me, why do you wait for a trend line to break? to get nervous and get out of the... I said, well, that's what technical is all about, risk, reward, and all these things. Oh, no. This is, I want to catch the absolute top and get out. I said, yeah. I'm saying, give me a break. <laughs> you know what? I want to catch the absolute bottom, too. I said, yeah. Good luck. Well, <laughs> as life would have it, he did it. <laughs> and... Um, I got to tell you that uh, I had the wonderful occasion. Where is Nancy? Is Nancy here? Oh, there you are. Hi, Nancy. I, I'm, I love that lady. She and her new husband, her husband, uh, Tom, came to the floor. I got them on the floor of the stock exchange. Remember? What year was that? No, I don't want to call. Okay. Well, anyway, it's what's great 
pleasure and honor that I present a fellow that has uh, meant a lot to me and to an awful lot of people. And what's so great about what Tom has done, he's created something different, exciting, creative, new, that we all use and accept and make a profit with. So where is he? Big Tom, come on out here, buddy. Thank you, Bill. I washed my hands. Yes. <laughs> All right. I think Larry wanted to say a few words first. Oh. Or do you want him to say it last? <laughs> yeah, he found, I think he was in the men's room. Larry, you all right? <laughs> Everyone is talking about the Southeast New York Met. We got the real New York Met over here, Steve Cohen. So, I forgot something, the award. <laughs> Thomas, here you are, big guy. Well, th thank you. Yes. It's a New York Mets hat. Steve, it's a Mets hat. Yeah, it is. No, it isn't. <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> My eyes. <laughs> the Chartered Market Technicians Association presents the 2020 annual award to Tom DeMarc for his. Oh my gosh, I can't read it either. It's been a long three days, fellas. Here, I'll read it. My fingers. Yeah. That's right. No, yeah. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Congratulations again. Thank you. Great job. Larry. Okay. You. <laughs> I am the happiest person in this entire room, not only because being here with Tom and his family and my wife, but the last time I spoke in New York was as COVID was breaking out. As I walked into a room, a young kid came up to me and said, my dad said I just had to see you before you passed away. <laughs> so to be back here alive, I mean, I am the happiest guy ever. And I look around at all these technicians, I would give a million dollars to hear what they would say if Graham and Dodd could be with us today. <laughs> what would those guys say, the fundamental guys saying all these technicians here? And you know, what a group. I mean, there's musicians here, there's people that are computers, there's people that play in bands, sing in bands. John Bullard made bands for us to trade with. I mean, <laughs> so, Peter's really bearish, I'm really bullish. We have totally disagreement, we have totally different techniques, and we all get along together. And we create things, we're friends. We ought to be in Congress instead of those guys. <laughs> yeah? And Nancy, Nancy has a great relationship with Tom. I asked her why, she said, well, you know, Larry, sometimes women have like secrets that we just gotta tell somebody. And I know if I tell Tom, he'll never tell anybody because he doesn't listen to me. <laughs> and my wife is here. Until today, she didn't know why I really got attracted to her. You know, sequential has 9 and 13 in it, right? And 13 is a big buy signal. When Louise told me that she was a 13th child, I said, I'm going along. <laughs> and it's the best trait of my life. Tom has created so many things. Uh, there are a lot of stories about Tom. The, the amazing thing to me, and I've known Tom about 51 years, I guess now, is his ability to process little tiny bits of data and make sense out of it, to decode the language of the markets, if you will. But then Tom sometimes is just like that, right? I mean, the ultimate story of Tom who doesn't always have a governor on what he says Tom was asked to meet with a guy, you probably heard George Soros, you know who George Soros is? 
so Soros wanted to hire Tom for market timing, and so Soros sat down with Tom, and Tom looked at him, and Tom, you know, Tom, Georgie Porgy. <laughs> I don't think George Soros had been called Georgie Porgy since the second grade in school. <laughs> but, you know, that's Tom. You never know what's going to come out of Tom's mouth, which has really made it as exciting for me to be with Tom and live through him so, so many things, creating stuff together with Tom and seeing his progress from a kid who I first met at the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago who was just like, you didn't know if he really liked the markets or not, but I think you could almost see a... A, a switch flipping his eyes that day, and he really got into this, and has become a legend in his time because what he's created is wor worldwide. Uh, a couple months ago, we were flying into Tanzania, and the guy on the plane next to me, we looked out, and there's Mount Kilimanjaro. And we started talking, he said, I'm gonna climb that mountain. I said, that's great, where are you from? I'm in New York, what do you do? I trade the markets a little bit. I said, oh, what do you use? I use Bloomberg. I said, Have you ever heard of Tom DeMar? Oh yeah, I love 913s. I said, do me a favor. When you get to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, put a 13 up there for me. And he said, I will. <laughs> so for a, until the end of time, there's going to be a 13 at uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. And that's Tom's work. What Tom has created for us is stuff that's going to be around way after Tom and I are gone, stuff that holds up, stuff that works. And it's just uh, amazing to have spent so much time with Tom the, and don't do it today, but what Tom is so unique about is he gives credit for people. And not many people do that in this business. We like to steal everybody else's ideas and claim credit for it ourselves, but Tom doesn't do that. Tom has really been uh, acknowledged other people in his life, which is very unusual in a lot of businesses, and especially this one. So it's one of his great attributes, but the friendship I've had with Tom, uh, it's, it's just been amazing. It's touched my life. Uh, and as he touched lives around him. So nobody deserves the award more than you did, Tom. Take it away, big guy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you all. I don't take advice very well, but I think I'm going to. My wife warned me before the speech. She says, make sure you have a script. And I said, yeah, 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 I'll take it, because I tend to go off script all the time. But I was outside, and I met this guy who wanted to shake my hand when I was going to the restroom. I said, what is it? He said, I'm a speechwriter for Joe Biden. Stick to the script. I said, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to do that. I mean, I may deviate a little. I mean, there are things that come to mind right now. I got a call Tuesday night, or it's an email Tuesday night. I'm really sorry. I don't know if I can make it. And I thought, it reminded me of Larry. Larry one time had a seminar scheduled on Saturday and Sunday, and I was there. He says, you're not going to believe this one, because there's always a story associated with Larry. I said, what's that one? He says, guy just came in. He apologized for missing the morning session. I said, really? What's, what's wrong with that, Larry? We had to go to his wife's funeral this morning. So the, <laughs> true. Yeah, true. <laughs> true. But everything happens to Larry, and I live, I've always lived vicariously through Larry. I mean, Larry is, was an idol of mine years and years ago, and continues through this time. He's been a close friend. I want to thank Peter and what I was saying. I got, I got contacted uh, Tuesday by email. He says, I don't think I can make it. And I said, who is this? And I looked, Peter Borsch. I don't think I can make it to the Mets game. And I said, oh, maybe he can still. I thought something came up with family. And I said, well, at least they'll make the, uh, the award dinner. But I said, I'm surprised. Mets are more important to him than an award dinner. So I was surprised to see that. And then I, I, Message him, I said, what's up? He said, I'm in the hospital, in the emergency room. And Peter said he didn't mind, I shared this with you. He uh, was being uh, tested for cardiology, cardiology by the cardiology department for different uh, symptoms. And I said, Peter, what is this? He said, Tom, don't worry. I may be getting a pacemaker, but I'll be there on Friday. So that's Peter. And that's Peter. Peter's been that way. As long as I've known him. And Peter, it was an experience working with you at Tudor. Uh, you and I had, had a great time. I looked at you as the younger kid, but you were a whiz kid, and you kept me going, too, because I always had a passion. But I saw in you a passion that I, that I had years earlier, and uh, it was really a, a treat for me to work with you the years I did. And obviously, Larry, the last five years, 
had been a kinship that I appreciate every day of my life, and he's like a brother to me. And uh, Larry has given me a lot of inspiration throughout the years. Now I'm going to read some of my texts before I go off topic. <laughs> Larry, anyone and everyone who has passed through the portals of technical analysis over the last 55 years has known you as a true, true trailblazer and industry pioneer. You have touched the lives of me and so many and the others in the room at one time or another, like no one else. You have inspired, promoted, underwritten us in our career paths. You have been generous with your time and guidance, supportive in your goals, responsive to our needs, directed our careers, and overall been a friend to all of every one of us in the industry. And I talked to Larry's wife. I said, I'm going to add this to my speech. Would you all please clap? No. And, <laughs> but I figured, she said, no, we don't want to Jeb Bush. We don't want to Jeb Bush. Uh, Oh, God. Too much. I would like to thank Ralph Ekampora. Uh, we met him, my wife and I did, and uh, on the trip, and, and Ralph was great to us. It really was. And every time Ralph talks to me, he says, I don't care about you, I care about your wife, Nancy. She's beautiful. Inside and out, you're not. So he's very... <laughs> and I've been told that by a lot of people. And I also thank, uh, obviously, people from CMTA. Uh, Elvin Kressler, Tyler Wood, and I said Tyler won't sometimes, but he would, uh, <laughs> and Bill Keller, not Bill Keller, not D Dave Keller, Bill Keller, but I thank Dave Keller too. Uh, you all been supported, supportive of me, and uh, no achievement is possible with the help, without the help and encouragement of others, and there have been many. I'm humbled and at the same time honored by this award, which I will cherish for a lifetime. It is my intention to continue to share and enhance the body of research I've created over the years. I remember in 1979 when uh, Larry Bird was, uh, was drafted by the Boston Celtics. And Larry, if you remember back then when, from Indiana State, he always looked like he had a question mark on his face. And he didn't look bright. I knew he was a good ball player. But he made a comment after he had been drafted. And he said, uh, I, don't, I can tell the Boston Celtics now, but I couldn't tell them before I signed. He said, but I love this game so much, I would have played for nothing. And that's true. If someone has a passion for something, it's, it's something special. And you want to do it regardless of what you're paid. Hi, Steve. <laughs> uh, I, this, it's rare for a person to have a vocation to avocation, which, which intersect, overlap. It's uh, been my life and good fortune over the last 50 years to have a wife who's tolerated me, and I'll get into that a little later. Uh, she's described my abilities and personality, and, and I've, I've taken this to heart, but that's about as far as I've taken it. Uh, <laughs> she's described things. She says, most people in life are on a continuum or have a, have a, uh, a spectrum between zero and 100, but prominently, between, primarily between 30 and 70 percent. She said, in my case, you're at the baseline. You're zero. There's one, one dimension where you spike to 100, maybe higher. And that's my passion, researching markets. And she said, uh, I'm one dimensional, which I admit I am. She said, I don't know what you would have done in your life had you not found the interest in the markets that you have. And that's true, and I'm sure it's the same for all of us. My father told me when I was first uh, interviewing for my first job, he said, there's, there's going to be ups and downs, but if you love what you're doing, you can't help but be successful. And that rings true, and I'm sure it rings true for most people here. Um, he described what I believe is an uptrend in life. He, uh, I, with my liberal arts degree and my MBA in law school, I found all to be worthless, because I wish I had just gone down to the CBOE when they opened and I would have been one of the first members and it would have been more challenging and more rewarding for me. But passion, curiosity, and most, support, most importantly, the support of those around one are, would feel a drive. As one looks back over here's her career, there are often many people who've made indelible com contributions, both personally and professionally. But few can be considered singular instrumental in one's success. I'm proud to say this honor could not have been possible Without the, 
encouraging my first employer. My first employer was uh, a uh, subsidiary of an insurance company. We managed 500 million. There were about nine professionals. That was one of them, but that was the lowest level, obviously, at the time. And um, we grew from 400, 500 million to 4 billion. And we were on the cover of institutional investor and everything. And my employer just gave me license to do whatever I wanted. And it's something akin to what Peter Borsch did for me. When I went to Tudor, he says, it's yours. And, and Paul endorsed it, too. There were conflicts, obviously, because <coughs> the uh, CFTC and the, and the SEC had us restricted as to what we could do. But Peter said, it's yours. Do what you want. We'll do it together. We'll be successful. And we were. Um, <coughs> there are two other people, obviously Larry, who I mentioned, and Steve Cohen, who have really made the difference in my life, made a difference in my family's life. And that's the most important thing. I've been working with, with Steve for almost 30 years. And my tolerant wife and six children have, have tolerated me, I think. You know, they've, they've stayed with me. Um, just to get into more specifics, with Larry, the first time I met him, the early 1970s, he described the uh, Blackstone Hotel. I remember my wife and I went. Well, we were just been married. And we went to Chicago in January. We've, drove in and she said, what do you, what's this nutty thing you're doing now? She said, you've done so many strange things. I've had strange technicians fly around the world and visit our company. <clears throat> I said, this guy's something else, Larry Williams. So we went to the Blackstone Hotel and we saw a line going around the block, down, what street was it? Uh, I can't even think of the name. It was down by Michigan Avenue, circled around. It turned out there was probably 2,500 people, at that time playing $3,000 a person. You know, current dollars is 10,000 plus. And uh, they all went into the, uh, to the large ballroom there, and Larry was the leader. He was the leader of the band. And what he, what he shared was, was valuable. So we got stronger and stronger, our relationship did. And that was, we worked together, we became collaborative on work. And uh, we've enjoyed a close personal friendship and uh, I'm grateful for his creativity, patience, and guidance. And the other person I mentioned, uh, well, two people, was, the, was uh, Peter, the whiz kid. And like I said, I, I, I can't, <laughs> I don't know if I would have done it, but to have Peter here today is a nice testament to our, our friendship and relationship. Um, the other person I owe a lifetime of goodwill and appreciation is an exceptional man. And I, I, I don't have to read this, I could tell you, but. I, with whom I've had the enormous pleasure of working the past three decades. Uh, I met Steve Cohen quite by chance. Someone told me that uh, he had a position available, and they suggested I, I contact him. And he was inaccessible even back then. And, but things nearly, nearly ended as quickly as he began, because one of the uh, officers of Steve's company informed me after my short-term contract had expired, he said it would not be renewed. So I contacted Steve, thanked him for the opportunity, and he said, what are you talking about? And I said, uh, well, I was just fired. And I said, you don't need my services? He said, who told you that? And I told him, I'm not going to give you the name, and he's not here. But um, he said, uh, who told you that? He said, I'm not going to fire you. I'm going to fire him. And that's, <laughs> you remember that, right? <laughs> And that, 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 that moment forged a friendship between Steve and me. And uh, his wife at times, said, well, this is years ago, but she told me I was like his second wife. And if you remember that, right? But that was before the trans movement or whatever. So I, <laughs> 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 That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, I was flattered by her comment, though, I'll tell you. <laughs> I got to watch what I say. So <laughs> she's, she's saying I, her, her leg is, I, I think it's, her leg is conditioned to do it. And she kicks me all the time. Then all the kids are here, too. They do the same thing. I got a couple of these this week, too. Uh, Steve took a flyer on me and has turned into a career for over a quarter century. He's been a mentor, a coach, supporter over the years. He set an example of integrity, quotes perseverance and priorities. And he's not often that one can learn so much from one person on so many levels and get paid for doing so. He's been an inspiration in the way he conducts his life and treats others. I have seen him operate firsthand 
and can say it has been an honor working with him and learning so much about the markets and life. While I'm one dimensional, Steve has taught me a person can evolve, pursue various interests with passion, whether that's the market, professional sports, art, or family. I marvel at his energy and the path that he has forged. He's truly one of a kind. Okay, obviously without the support of one's family, very little is possible. I'm not crying, it's just, I got a RFK voice, no. Uh, very, very little is possible, regardless of one's passion. Unless your wife, children accept an absentee spouse and father, it is difficult to imagine one being, being able to go through the periods of trials and errors and emotional roller coasters just to receive one's personal goals. My wife has been, my wife of 50 years, encouraged and directed me, but never forced me. I am grateful she gave me the, I got the rest of it here. Oh, someone removed the page. No. <laughs> I, you did it. I knew it. She always tells me she's going to embarrass me because for all the years I've embarrassed her. Uh, but she's given me the latitude to pursue my passion. I kept a copy. So. <laughs> my passion, and none of this is possible without her. My family has been the foundation of my career, and I'm truly blessed for their love and support. Again, I would like to express my sincerest gratitude to all members for this special award. I did not see it as a culmination of lifetime research, but rather the bridge to a future of additional groundbreaking developments in market timing analysis. To quote my father, who I found out has quoted somebody else, he said, one success is often attributed to luck, but the strange thing is, you will find the harder you work, the luckier you will get. Thank you all, and may you all have the best of luck in all your pursuits. <laughs> There's more. I got, I got more. I got chapter two and three here, so we can sit up and sit down. I got to tell the truth. TJ wrote a lot of this. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> but uh, thank you all, and I appreciate it. And it's an honor I didn't expect, but I lobbied for it for about 10 years, right, Ralph? <laughs> Where did Ralph go? <laughs> um, why don't you say something else? <laughs> I've said a lot of good things about myself. Now you can say some good things about me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about me now. <laughs> sit down. I'll talk about you. Sit down, sit down. So, so you're going to do a QA or something now, Tyler? Great. We should get Peter here, too. Have Steve. In. I don't want to put Steve on the spot. No. I really, I tell you, I can't believe Steve Cohen is here. Uh, you, you people, can I say something or not? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did I drop? I dropped, did I drop a phone here? Yeah. Hey, you're, you're calm. What do you your say? Talk was, your, your talk was incredible. I got to talk to you more. It was amazing. Steve, Steve said to me <clears throat> for a number, well, a number of times when he first bought the Mets, he says, you can throw out the first pitch. You can throw out the first pitch. And I said, uh, oh, yeah? And I was skeptical of it. I said, oh, OK, it's OK. And he said, next time you come to New York, let me know. So when I, the award ceremony, I called Steve, and I said, Steve, I can do it now. He says, do what? Did I tell you that? <laughs> did, did I tell you that? I said, yeah. And I'm really nervous with him. That, that story about George Soros, by the way, is true. With George, <laughs> see, I've tried to remember why that happened. I was in George Soros' off, well, he had an anti office, and I was there with uh, Zach Bacon. No, I wasn't Zach Bacon, Jim Marquez, somebody from Soros. And, uh, huh? Could have been Zach. Yeah, it could have been. But, but I was sitting there, and he said, you, Do you know George? I said, I think I met him. I don't, I don't know for sure. He said, He wants to meet you. So George walks, I see this guy walking, really dapper, you know, thin, the opposite of me, wavy black hair, and he comes walking in, and he just, he went like this. Now, his son, I know, has eye problems. I don't think George did, but he was going like this. And he looked right at me, and he has piercing blue eyes. And he just stared at me. And I said, hi, George. 
He just kept staring. And I felt so uncomfortable. And out of my mouth came, Georgie Porgy. <laughs> and I, but I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. And, <laughs> well, TJ knows why. And I never could, I, I couldn't, I couldn't resolve how I came up with that. And about, <laughs> but Larry could. So I looked, I looked, I mean, I was reading three, four weeks ago, and I heard this song on, on uh, yacht, yacht Radio, if you listen, that's your Yacht Radio with that guy's voice. He sounds like, like Day, uh, uh, what's uh, Paul Day. The guy's got your voice on this, uh, this uh, serious radio, this Yacht Radio, and, and this song is playing, and it's Georgie, Georgie Porgy, Porgy, Georgie Porgy. Yeah, it was by Toto, and it was in 1979, 1980, and that's when I was in the office. That's why I said it, I just blurted it out. <laughs> I've done a lot of bad things, and I, I, I'm a naughty boy, what? I think, you know, now that it's the 50th anniversary of the CMT, and, and we think about all-star teams, and, you know, you go through baseball, I'm a big baseball fan, and you think about the 50th greatest players of all time, and, you know, maybe you start with Babe Ruth, whatever, in, in our business, and when I was younger, and Larry came out with his first indicators, and I tried to, to program them. But there's no question in my mind that when you put together as this 50th anniversary, no one deserves you award more than you because you stand out there as number one. No. You're, you're, <laughs> no, because you have so many innovation. Larry's innovated. Bob Prechter's innovated. A lot of people, Peter Elites. But when you put together the magnitude and the content. And I'm proud to say that I was able to steal, and I mean <laughs> that in the best way possible, a lot of your uh, ideas and innovation. My strength is uh, a good copier and trying to uh, put it together in a more formalized way. Yeah. But you led the way. You're the all-time all-star. Thank you. And Peter, f following up on that, I helped Tom put together Sequential. And what's really fascinating about that, he was living in Racine, Wisconsin. I'm in Kalispell, Montana. Did we have a computer? No. We had stacks of commodity perspective charts. And every night we'd get on the phone, Tom, and I'd go, well, we're trying to identify a wave, because Bob Prechter had a wave. Elliot has a wave. How do we identify a wave? Well, a moving average, a closed greater, oh, three days ago, two greater than 18 or 13 or 27. And finally, we stumbled on this, four closes are greater than nine ago. And like, that's a wave. And then these things would stop in the market. And then we went into the, well, where does it go next? And I think Tom did most of it. I came up with the name sequential. That was my main contribution. I'm good with words, um, <laughs> but not much else. Uh, but, so we, but we put this together over the telephone with no computers, Peter. And that, to me, is really, uh, because what it's incredible, and he took it then to Combo, which made it so much better, that you don't have to have a computer to succeed. You really look at this stuff and really get into it. It's there. You just have to look and observe. It's there. It's really there. You don't, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to come up with answers. Well, you have to live and breathe the markets. Yeah. And as Nancy can attest, there's no one that I know uh, that lives and breathes the markets more than Tom. You. And, and when we came through uh, with Sequential and we started to, to program it, and part of trading and risk management, and you remember this, that some of the best trades are failures because that meant that it wasn't a bottom, it was a point of acceleration, and a lot of money is made right at the end of moves. And that was a learning process in itself. And to this day, you know, you, you can't be static. Someone asked that question earlier, and Tom is never resting on his laurels. He's constantly studying, which is also what keeps him young. And oh. I think it may contribute to your sense of humor as well. Yeah, well, God well sense Paul, Paul Jones told us, the ones that don't work, work the best. Because you get stopped out and you reverse your position. And that's what happened. That's what you're saying. One of the big changes, and I'm so glad that Peter's talked about it, is because of Peter and Paul, 
Um, I had a really interesting experience years ago here in New York City. Dick Donchin, who you all know Dick Donchin, he won the Lifetime Achievement Award as well, took me to meet a guy named Alf Beam, who may not, a lot of you don't recognize, it was, used to be per Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Pierce Fenner, Smith, and Beam. He was the founding partner of Merrill Lynch. And uh, Alf Beam was an old, old guy, went to his office. His office was about as big as this room. And I walked in, and he said, Dick Donchin said, uh, this is Larry Williams, a commodity, commodity trader, huh? Wait, wait, wait. Can, we, we, yeah. got an ad, we, got, we got the spread covered, though, right? For tonight. Thank you very much, Let's Steve. go, Max. Thanks. Let's go. go. Thanks, <laughs> That's the best trader in history. Al Bean said, I've Why never you, seen a commodity he's trader. He's the best trader in history, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Best I've ever seen. Yeah. And I've seen Paul Steve Steve Jones Jones's trades, too. But yeah, Steve. Al Bean said, I've never seen a commodity trader come out ahead with the exception of one son of a bitch who put his money in a trust so he couldn't touch it. And that's the way commodities were prior to Paul because we had no idea of money management. Dick Donchin's funds blew up all the time. I'd go up, go down, a lot of fun with cowboy, kamikaze cowboy trading, until you guys came along and figured out, we better have some risk control. When you, you talked about risk control, huge change in this business. All commodity funds prior were boom bust, boom bust, and you guys figured out we can't do it that way, and you did risk management. And that revolutionized this business, what you guys did. Totally revolutionized it. Thank you. Different game. And guys like Tom and I, we're just artists. We just come up with this stuff, and then you guys can really implement it into great things. We're good thieves. <laughs> <laughs> right? we, we, you are the intellectual powerhouses, and we were good implementers. Yeah, it's well, it fun to be that, to know what you're good at. Like, Tom and I know what we're good at. We couldn't manage money and do all You got business people. We just like to look at charts. I'm good at speeches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if someone writes them for you. Excuse me, guys. I gotta run, but I want to tell a quick story about Tom. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm testing. Yeah. Okay. Just a quick story about Tom. You know, everyone's treating him like he's a god and he's so wonderful, and he's a very eccentric guy. Okay. Let me tell you a quick story. This, I think it was an MTA conference, and it was probably 20 years ago or longer, and we had a formal dinner that evening. It wasn't formal, tuxedo or whatever, but it was dressed up, okay? And we're all sitting around talking, and after about 20 minutes, this guy comes walking down the stairs in Bermuda shorts. <laughs> do you remember that? I don't know. What I, you described me. I, I, I was on the plane in Bermuda shorts. He says, don't sit next to me. <laughs> we didn't call you Tommy Porgy. <laughs> anyway, th thank you. You guys are all great. I love you all, but my son is in town here, and I got to go to dinner with him. Enjoy, enjoy the the uh, show, show tonight. The great Peter Lattes. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you want to take a few questions, Tom? Sure. Questions from the audience. We have two mics. No waiting. No one. My wife's got a question. <laughs> Tom, Larry. We're at dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah. Where are we going to eat? Yeah. Tom, Larry, it's great to be here, and it's such an honor. Uh, this mic right here? Do we need to turn anything on? Check, check. Steve is going to Steve is going to the game. You can shout. It's a great honor to be here, and thank you so much. Uh, love to get your take on the current market. For Peter, you want to go this way? No. Uh, we got Peter earlier, but he can yes. say more given some time passed. <laughs> 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 uh, fortunately, it's Friday afternoon at 4.15. I will worry about it Sunday at 6. <laughs> Me ne I'm next. Um, it looks like to us we're going to top Monday. 4207, the S&P. And we've held fast on that. In fact, what we've done, we don't have a public face, really. And what we found, you know, Larry introduced me to Kramer. He's never met Kramer, by the way. He's never talked to Kramer, but he's on Kramer. They quote, they quote Kramer, uh, Larry every night on Kramer, almost. They also were quoting me. And uh, we had, uh, we considered Kramer a resource in the sense that we would have a documented 
And if you go back and look at our, uh, TJ runs uh, the symbolic chart service, which is new, and all the indicators are in there. But he, he uh, we wanted people to know that we had what would per be perceived publicly as a top or bottom of the market. And fortunately, it's called all the Bitcoin turns. I mean, we get a lot of publicity on that. It's called the exact day is the highs and exact day the lows. But we had to go to some source, and we decided this guy named Goldstein at Market Watch was as impersonal as anyone. So all I do is send something to him, he posts it, and that's it. So it's there for posterity. Um, we had had 4207 as our upside objective for weeks on the S&P and uh, SPY, or for SPX. And uh, we forecast, told Steve too, and, and the other client I have, that we probably top today, but it looks like Monday. Uh, and I mean, you could take it and leave it. I mean, it's not meant as advice. But uh, we get a 13 on m uh, Monday or Tuesday as well. It's uh, combo 13 on the, the S&P. Uh, Bitcoin, we had the day of the, we were on Fox, and we had the day of the low, 15.375, and we were looking for the upside. And same with Euro dollar. If you go back and type it in, if you get bored or something, you'll see those market calls. So, but we're, we, we're ready to, to see some kind of top, I think, as early as uh, next Monday or Tuesday. Which, which, by the way, goes into what I was talking about before, the intersection of the technicals and the fundamentals. So you have this 13 corresponding to the Fed meeting, which starts on the second and announcement on the third. Coincidence? Or is that technical analysis at its best? I'm going for the latter, and it's good to get the count from the best of the best. Thanks, Tom. Well, what you look for is really, we've had a number of calls on Bitcoin, and we didn't even know that the indicators applied to Bitcoin. TG and was talking to John Burbank, who Passport Capital was a sensational fund manager in 2006, 7, 8, 9. He, was, he went from 100 million to 6 billion or whatever. He told us to follow Bitcoin, and we didn't, we didn't, we postponed it, we finally did. And we looked back in time, boy, it worked really well. So we apply it to Bitcoin, and uh, um, the same indicators, what we found is that for Bitcoin, the conjunction or intersection of time and price is the most important. If you can get a 13 or whatever you're looking for, and a price objective, it's coincident within one or two days of, of each other, it has more impact than it, just one by itself. So that's... Uh, we're going to see that intersection. I, I think about May 10th, we start to top out in the market. So I'm going to give the market a little bit more breathing room than these guys do. Then we'll have a pullback, but we are in a bull market. This bull market has a lot of time left into it, probably up into 2025. Then the game changes a lot, I think. But uh, I, I see absolutely no reason to be bearish in this market, which means you want to buy big breaks and pullbacks like we saw last week. It's a buying opportunity. We're in a bull market and you need to play it that way. Well, I've got a question. Speaking of Bitcoin, Adrian Zdenczyk, I had, I had this pleasure yesterday uh, to talk a little bit with Larry. Congratulations, of course. It's an honor to be asking questions to such legendary people like yourselves. Uh, and there was a question in, uh, in my head, and I got, got a little bit worried, right? Because I put in this, uh, this chart, not, not a chart, it was a piece of paper, and I wrote, buy Bitcoin. And I couldn't help but just stand at the podium at the New York Stock Exchange and flash it. And all of a sudden, I see Larry's taking pictures of me. So my question to Larry, because I was really afraid that you're going to put it in a book under the worst calls category ever or something like that. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? All right. <laughs> it's being published. Yeah. Well, that'll be, it wasn't well if you could put it in a book, the picture you took. Uh, yeah, just don't, don't put me in the worst calls. You know, I'm, I'm with Warren Buffett on Bitcoin. And, I, and I'll stay with Ian Charlie Munger on that view. It's a great thing to trade, but it, eventually it's going to go away. Like when I traded eggs and pork bellies, those things were great trading vehicles, and they went away. So I don't see the future for Bitcoin that these young people do. But I'm 81 years old. What do I know about this stuff? It's so a trading are you vehicle. sure you're not going to put me in the worst calls in the book? <laughs> worst calls I've ever had? No, I ever had. Oh, you ever had? <laughs> sure. <laughs> then i got to write a book. I have arthritis. I don't to write books anymore. Tom, we have a question over here. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Tom. I think it's a very well-deserved award. Oh, sorry. Oh, Tom Lee, thank yeah. you very much. I didn't Tom, see you there. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as, a, as someone who's been in the industry for 30 years, I've uh, used your work for many years when I was at J.P. Morgan. So I think it's, uh, 
it's kind of magical. Um, but I, I have two questions for you. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not 80 yet. I look it, though. Is that one? <laughs> um, you know, the first is, Tom, it's a Lifetime Achievement Award. So I'm, I think a lot of people here, especially the younger generation, might be interested in any advice you would have given to your younger self uh, when you first started in the business. Okay. Well, I'll let you give, give you a chance to think about that. Because the second question I'd ask is, uh, when you hear Larry, and I know Larry mentioned this to me on Wednesday that uh, he's quite constructive. He, you know, he from from his experience, he thinks this is the start of a pretty extended bull market move. I know you mentioned Monday, but I don't know within your fractal if you think that's uh, in the larger picture. How do you? How does your view line up with Larry's? My answer to the first question is. What would I advise people? I've advised my kids, and none of them, with the exception of TJ, has really got the passion. The others do to a degree. One has interest in programming for the company, another more accounting, and another some another area uh, with uh, with the uh, program trading. So there is, but it's difficult. The environment's totally different than it was when I started. I tell you, people technicians used. Only two indicators, moving averages and trend lines, and they use sentiment indicators like uh, odd lot short sales and special short sales. That was about it. The real curiosity was with the retail people, not the institutional technicians. They all spoke the same language. So that's all evolved. And I think we've been somewhat responsible for, for upgrading what, what the tools. Um, as far as could people do it nowadays, I don't think so. I mean, I, I had a special case. I, I mean, one thing is, first of all, uh, you got to marry right, or you can marry left, whatever, up, down, whatever. But I mean, <laughs> she has she is, she is let me do, she's given me a license to do anything. I always wondered, what, who, who else is she seeing? She doesn't get upset. She doesn't get upset. She doesn't get upset when I stay overnight and work with programmers. And I did that for years. And I, I was so obsessed and committed, and, and she tolerated, and the kids did too. They had an absentee father. So it was bad, but ultimately, in the end, I'm trying to justify it. I, we live well because of all the work. <laughs> she would have lived. She would have lived better if she had left me. I didn't want to tell her that because she would have gotten everything. But <laughs> Tom, she just lit up. Tom, Tom, <laughs> but it, it, the environment's totally different. I fell into it. Law school was a waste. Graduate school business a waste for me. Liberal arts degree? No way, you know. And and I, I'm, I'm looking back. I mean, the kids, the kids all went to good schools too. But I don't think they use their tools. They went to liberal arts degrees, and Dartmouth, Williams, places like that. I don't think they use those skills. But I had a unique, unique. No one else, I don't think, had what I had at the time. I fell into it. I got directed to this insurance company subsidiary. Tony Orfanos is here right now. He knew me back after a few years of that. They just gave me a license to do whatever you want. Here, we got all this money because we we're the fastest growing company. We paid in commission dollars. You want people to fly in from overseas? Do it. You want books? You want any, anything your heart desires? Get it, and that's what I did. But then I got saturated. But I think the biggest change was knowing people in the institution area like Leon Cooperman. He was the closest friend for years. He was there Wednesday night at the game with us. Um, he just he inspired me, and he, he, he wanted me, I was going to join Goldman Sachs as a partner. I turned that down. I just wanted to do research, and I was committed to research. But I fell into it with a fellow named Van Hoisington. I mean, there, there were all these people that were They're so people. good to me. you know. And, but that's not going to happen to anybody else. And, but the key was I was institutional, but I knew Larry, and I knew Peter. They were more, not, I don't want to say Peter wasn't retail, but he was, he was hybrid. Larry was retail. So I got some exposure, and I didn't get the exposure on the retail because of myself. They didn't like me. FNN was up. Larry said, why don't you try it? So he got me on. He and I alternated every week. I mean, John Bollinger was on. I remember John was, a, was working. I don't know if he's here, but he was a lighting man at the time, and he, he helped us out quite a bit. I mean, John Bollinger made FNN in the technical, analytical side. You had Bill Griffiths, Sue McMahon, Herrera. You had Ron and Son and Insomnia, whatever you call them. But he, he was there. <laughs> but, but John Bollinger was the man behind the scenes. I mean, that's why people watched FNN. 
because they had touches of this. And uh, so, I mean, I fell into it. I mean, it's, it was luck. My wife says, and that's when, I, when they quoted it here. My dad says, uh, the harder you work, or they quoted somebody else, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And that's it. My wife said, a lot of this is luck, and it has been. The right people at the right time. I mean, it's with Steve Cohen. Um, I mean, that was just fortuitous, if you look back. And he, he and I have already fallen asleep. See, that's one of mine, grandson. Miles, because he's yawning away. So that's what I've Baseball done to all man. the kids. So he asked about the markets. You're directing, what? You're directing to the markets. By the way. Which was, I want to answer your other question. What was it? Yeah, I think you look great. <laughs> I do. Your, your face on TV is a lot better than mine. So I'm going to put in uh, two plugs right now. One, it's an honor to see John Bollinger here because he's another one that I stole from. <laughs> uh, which is critical. And I can assure you that Tom Lee will be up here getting this award because what he does in his firm and, and the analysis, you may not always agree with it. We, we You know, Tom and Larry are just... Disagree. That's what makes a market, but to have someone who the key to this business in my mind is to be intellectually honest. And there's no question in my mind that, that Tom, who is out there and is firm and his technical analyst internally, is really outstanding, uh, deserves credit, and he's the next generation. He may be a technician too, but I know Mark Newton's a great technician. And you, you hired him, which is great. So, uh, you, had a, a, a you made a great step that way. The other thing is, I'm going to tell everybody a secret. It's not John Bollinger, it's Zoe. It's Zoe. It's, it's Zoe. Zoe. Zoe is the future. <laughs> the, the thing about John Bollinger, and some of you don't know when Tom was talking about FNN, you know what that was? It was Financial News Network. It eventually became CNBC and all this business stuff we have now. So FNN had these television programs out of Los Angeles. People followed the markets on. And there was this guy named John Bollinger on, a whole bunch of other people, that once FNN became MSNBC or whatever the business channel is now, all the talking heads continued being talking heads. Except one guy said, no, I'm a trader, John Bollinger. John Bollinger said, no, I'm a technical guy. This is what I do. And so John's Mr. Market. The rest of them are just talking heads on television yeah, if, that, that don't trade, don't do any of this. John Bollinger's a real deal. If you don't have John Bollinger's, if, you, if you're not subscribed to his uh, markets list, highly recommend it. And then, like I said, but I can hardly Zoe's wait, behind I can it, hardly wait for John to retire because he's always <laughs> taking over. <laughs> no, I tell you, there's a lot of information there. So. In this business, gossip is easy. Right? We all gossip. I'd rather gossip about sports, which is sort of bad for me because I'm a Mets fan, I'm a Knicks fan, and I'm a, but that's gossip. Real work, real technical analysis is difficult, stressful, and the innovators come along every once in a while, like in every profession. And Tom, of course, was the first to say, well, no one's going to follow, but Larry was there, John was there, Peter Lighty's, a lot of other people in this room, and the next generation is Tom and, and, and Mark and their team, and they're, they're not gossiping. You may not want to believe it, that's your opinion, that's what makes markets, but they're not gossiping. Well, one thing, I mean, I, I don't want to keep you, all you people, um, the, uh, my wife was tolerant, because when she first married me, I got into Fibonacci numbers, and I went to the New York Library, and, and out of the archives, I've got Nature's Law, and I read it inside out, Pyramid Power was mentioned in that treatise by R.N. Elliott, and it said, Mark, uh, it said that uh, uh, pyramids are built at the golden mean angle, 61.8%. And it says, the pyramid, if you construct something at that angle, you can sharpen dull objects. So I remember I got a little pyramid, a buddy of mine, who was a plumber, or pseudo architect, built a, built a, a pyramid. And I said, I got an idea, and I wanted to test it. So I took one of my razor blades that was dull and put it in there. And I waited, waited for it to sharpen. It didn't sharpen. I looked at her, and I said, this is supposed to work. She said, what are you doing? She said, I said, if I read this book correctly, it's supposed to sharpen a dull object. She said, put your head in it. She said, <laughs> you did too. And then she, I'll tell you, we've been there and back. I mean, she, she was saying yesterday, she, she was saying to me, 
don't bring it up, don't bring it up. I got so obsessed. I mean, it was to the point where it really, I mean, it borderline. And Tony will tell you that, and Joe Duranos, all these people. I was inviting people, I had so much money. I remember there's stories in the book that I, that, I, that I wrote the first book. And no, I don't get any royalties. It all goes to charity. People say that about all of our books, and it's the case. Um, but anyways, I invited a guy. I was so into Fibonacci. And I called the um, bank credit analyst, a guy named Tony Beck was the editor. He was in Bermuda and Toronto. I said, hey, I read this, uh, I, I read in your bank credit analyst uh, 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 monthly report that Hamilton Bolton knows a lot about Elliot. Can I talk to him? He says, Hamilton Bolton, he's been dead for three years. I said, well, who, who, do, you, who do you recommend that I talk to? And I, I, he didn't like me bothering me because I was bothering everybody. I said, well, big talker. We'll invite you in. We'll pay your way. And he thought I was nuts. And uh, he said, well, you can contact this fellow named Jack Frost, who is a traveling tax judge, his real name, in Canada. So I called Jack Frost. I was able to reach him. And it was difficult. And I said, hello, Jack. This is Tom DeMarc. I see it, it was in October or November. I said, you paint in the flowers, Jack? You know, I didn't know if Jack Frost was joking. He says, you must be a Yankee. I said, yeah. I said, New York Yankee fan. He said, no, you're from the States. I said, yeah. I said, can you help me with Fibonacci and things? I, Tony Beck said, no, no, I got two doctors you might want to call. One is in Merritt Island, Florida. The other one's in Wildwood, Florida. So I called this Dr. Wiley. And I said, hey, our company is manages Three billion or something. I want to wants to fly you into town. We want to understand Elliott Wave. He says, "Oh, I can I'll teach you. I, I know it inside out." So he, I said, "I said, can you come out? We'll pay your way. Come out during the day." He said, "No, I can only come on a Friday." So I told all the guys at work. I said, "And they're all professionals. They were all attorneys, MBAs, CPAs, and they were all prim and proper. And I wasn't. I was wearing shorts back then too. But anyways, he uh, he said, "Yeah, I'll come on Friday." So I remember I went to the airport. I walked up and down the concourse waiting for this guy, and I called his office. They were an hour ahead of, ahead of us. Unfortunately, I got the nurse or whatever, and I said, We're waiting for, I'm waiting for Dr. Wiley, and I don't want to be embarrassed. I have to take him in the office. And she's, he'll find you. I mean, these guys who work with me have heard this story a number of times. And uh, all of a sudden, this guy comes up to me with a long gray beard, kind of like your beard, but gray. And he pointed at me, and he said, you are Tom DeMarc. He said, do you know how I know? And I said, no. He said, you're walking in Fibonacci angles. So I had to take, I mean, no, this, this is true. She'll tell you that, too. These are people that I collected on the way. I had them in, I had them that Friday in the, in, the, in the big, cheery office. I think you remember that, Tony, but we had our office when all, we, we, were, we did really the job back then. We had everything just perfect. He came in, and I had all these guys, said, this is the expert in LA Wave, and he just looked at me. And I said, will you tell him about Elliot Wade? And he said, sure. And he brought out these big binders, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233, 377. Right. But anyways, but anyways they, he went over, and I thought, oh, gosh, I'm going to lose my job. I told her I'm going to lose my job. So Monday I went in, and all these guys said to me, look, be more circumspect. Know what you're doing. Follow up first. Do the job first before you invite people in. So they weren't too mad. So I went, try, had to try the other guy, and the other guy was... Uh, Oh, Ledbetter, Dr. Ledbetter, Merritt Island, Florida. And I said to him, I asked this girl, I said, is he available? She says, what's he regarding? I said, Fibonacci. She says, ah. she says, do you want an appointment? I said, no, it's Fibonacci. He got on the phone. He said, what do you want to know? I said, I heard you're an expert on Fibonacci. And he said, uh, yeah, sort of. He said, I've been married three times. No, five times. I have eight kids. And every 13 days, I take a vacation. So I knew I, knew I was on the edge where it shouldn't be. And then I started getting these books. She'll tell you, I was getting books from library. I can't remember the uh, that guy, Omen. His name is Omen. Out of Traders. Oh, yeah, Traders. Yeah, but out of yeah. Texas, right. Dallas. Yeah. I got every book. I bought every one because I had all the commission dollars. The and we had these group. books. I'd bring them in, and they the Illuminati, Fluminati. Yeah, right, right, right. He, he would write on a... He, With felt-tip pen. And felt, oh, it's terrible. She said, get this out of the house. This is the devil. And... <laughs> One, one thing before we break, because I see the clock's at zero, I do want to give... It goes minus, so you don't have to worry. Yeah. I wanted to give a, <laughs> a shout-out. I wanted to give a shout-out to Jason Pearl, who wrote a book on DeMarc Indicators, who flew all the way from London thank you. for 24 hours just to see Where's you. Where's Jason? So, thank you, Jason. Where's Jason? I want to... Okay. I'll see you, and I'll do you one better. Z... Uh, Lizal, Lizal, Mr. Met, 
You flew in from where? Hong Kong? Paul D. From Dubai? There he is. Where's Hugh? Hoogs. I got to pronounce your name right. Is Hoogs here? Hoogs. From Singapore. Uh, come on, come on. Sammy. Sammy. From Finland. Noi. From Thailand. Rick Knox. Little Rock. <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. It's, I'll tell you one thing that's nice about, well, I can finish up that story, by the way. <laughs> no, no, no. No, We're you got to hear it. You got to hear it. We would just, <laughs> the, we, we would have Bob Farrell come in, and we'd have Dick, uh, Dick Van Dyke, um, Dick McCabe. Yeah, Dick Van Dyke lived near us. So I, um, Dick McCabe would come in, and I said, you guys got to see this. I shared it with the, Nature's Law, I gave it to them. And Bob Newrock was involved too, but if you guys all remember that. And I gave him Nature's Law, and they said, what is this? And then we talked about it wave, and that was in 1982 or so. It was years later. And all of a sudden, is Bob Prechter here? No. All of a sudden, I get a call. I talked to Bob Prechter. I didn't know who he was. And he said, uh, hey, Tom. He said, I, I, I'm going to start, a, I'm gonna start a, uh, a market letter. And I said, really? I said, well, good, good for you. And he said, it's going to be Fibonacci based. I said, it is? I said, well, he said, I work Merrill Lynch. I got your treatise, because you had your name on it, and it filtered down from the 12th level all the way down to his level, New Rock and all the guys. And he said, I'm going to charge $144 for six months and $233 for a full year. And I said, I got your first two subscribers, Ledbetter and, Wy Wy uh, Ledbetter and uh, Wy Dr. Wiley. So. <laughs> But you know, it's 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 a small community. It's got smaller, and uh, I don't know if there's much more they can do. You know. Oh, there's more stuff out there to find out. Not short term. I don't know. Is oh there? yeah, there's. You know, we haven't cracked this all the way at all. There's more to learn. A lot more to learn. Always. Yeah.